So let's read together Genesis 1, 1 to 3. And the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. There's two aspects I would like to talk about uh, today. One is creation. And usually when we read this scripture, we, we think, well, this talks about creation. But I would like to see in a different perspective. Not creation, but the, the creator. God, he's the creator. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth. And when we go to school and we learn about the things of the world, we also learn about creation. It happened to me, so when I went to school, I, I heard all the theories about creation, how uh, in the physical world, probably there was a big explosion and the Big Bang and things started to form. And that's the physical aspect of creation. Now, the Bible doesn't contradict science. On the contrary, on the contrary, Bi the Bible confirms science eventually, many years after science uh, comes to a conclusion, things were already written in the Bible. Like the Bible says that the earth is, is, a, is, is spherical, it's, it's round. And uh, people came to that conclusion just in the Middle Ages. And, and so, so the, but the Bible already talked about the globe, the globe of the earth. So there's many things that we don't know, but they're hidden in the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about physics today, but I'm talking about spiritual world, the spiritual world, world. And learning is a great thing. And as human beings, we deposit all this learning uh, that we start uh, getting in our memory banks in school and through our friends and TV. And uh, we, we learn about creation, things that other people created. And, uh, and mainly, we see so many things around, around us. We try to understand how things work. How, uh, what's the origin of life? Uh, how does, uh, um, for instance, uh, w w what is a chair for? And we start learning all these things uh, since we were born. But uh, as we learn more and more about the physical world, many times we neglect to understand the spiritual world. And the material world was created from the spiritual world. Nothing existed. It was energy. It was nothing. But out of nothing, God created something. And it's the world and the universe where we live on. And when we come across the subject of God, when we try to understand God, we come across all the historical matters regarding God. What did uh, the, the first man believe in? Now the first civilization. Okay, the Egyptians, they had all these gods. And, uh, and then the, the Greeks had all the pantheon of gods. And then the Romans... Uh, copy their gods and then the oriental had their gods and all these things until we get to the Bible and we understand that then a people uh, there in a tiny country in, in Israel they found God and they said there's no there's not a lot of gods there's one God so historically we can also try to study the subject of God to try to understand God but as we uh, read last week and as we've been talking about the things of God are not meant to be studied and understood in, with our mind, but the things of God have, have to be approached in a spiritual matter. God is spirit. We cannot find God with a microscope. Even though if we use a microscope or a telescope, if we try to study the world around us, eventually we can find that there is a, a, a divine presence. There's something beyond just coincidence. It's not just by coincidence that life exists or that we are here. There is a creator. And here in Genesis chapter 1, we can read that God, in the beginning, God created. God created. So there's a, a, a spiritual uh, person that we call God, that we try to understand, that our minds are too small to try to understand, and, and God that created the universe, all things, the earth, and created us, in fact, he wants to communicate and have fellowship with us. And today we're going to see that, in fact, this passage of Scripture, in Genesis chapter 1, 
It's not just talking about an entity that we call God, but Jesus Christ himself. He was there because he was the word of God that called all things into existence. Now, in Romans chapter 1 and on verse 25, and I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, the Bible says that people traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things of God uh, that God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So what we see in our world today and through history is that people worship creation rather than worshiping, worship the Creator. Why? Because creation can be seen, touched, felt. We can see these things around. God is invisible. And so we, we tend to worship the things we see. This is why through history, men try to represent God in many ways. They represent God as a mother. They represented uh, God as a, 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 a man, an old man in heaven. They represented God in many ways. However, we cannot represent God uh, as, a, as an image or as something we paint or we build. In fact, God said this is even a sin. It enters in the realm of sin when you try to do this. It's, do this. it's called idolatry. So please understand that in order to seek God and find God, we cannot change the truth for a lie. Amen. And the world today changes the truth for a lie because they say that man created God. They say that people in this search, this inner search for uh, the matters of life and death, they start to become mystical. So many cultures created different kinds of gods and they talked about the spiritual world. And since the beginning of existence that man tried to find God. Now I have good news for you. You can truly find God and you can find him today. If you don't know God, you came here, you came probably to check it out, see how the church is, what are they talking about, what are they singing? But you can find God today and leave this place today with this blessed hope that God is with you always. Amen. Now, let's go a little bit further and let me do this question. Who do you worship? One of the reasons, you know, that I don't like to study philosophy. I like philosophy, but I don't like to study philosophy. And at school, I had a problem with this study. Because uh, when you study philosophy, you're not studying philosophy itself, but you're studying the philosophers. So you're learning who the philosophers were. So you learn about the Greek philosophers and the French philosophers and all these philosophers and people that were big thinkers. And we need philosophy in order to have morals and to have these things, uh, uh, you, you know, to, to, to be people of influence. We need to have our own philosophy of life. But. Uh, well, this said, uh, I don't like to study the life of Descartes and, all, and the life of all these people, but I like to study their ideas. You know, when we come to church, many times we can have the tendency of analyzing church and, and see, the, see the, the, the Bible and the things of God as a philosophy. And think, well, is this something that I'm going to accept or reject? Is this, uh, well, is this church, well, this church is what, Pentecostal? So uh, are they holding snakes? Or are they, are they doing the weird things? Are people rolling on the floor? Uh, is it that we're going to have the, the pastor laying hands and people start to fall on the floor? What, what is it going to happen here? What, what do these people believe? And you see, the, the thing about philosophy is that we, we tend to study the lives of people. And, and, and in terms of Christian and religions, uh, in terms of Christianity, we call the Christian philosophy theology. Theology, the study of God. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to study God and to have Bible schools and to study scripture. But studying these things will not get us into a relationship with God. You can read the whole Bible, you can know all the, the historical truth about, about the Bible, but still miss the point. And the point is, when we study the Bible and the things that happen and all these things, our focus is on creation, things that happened. But when you decide to worship the Creator, now things get different. You know, in the, in the Christian world today, we have excellent music. 
There's ex excellent prison worship bands. I like to listen to Hill songs and to Matt Radman and all these bands and all these Christian singers. And I, I love to go to a Christian concert with thousands of people and just worship the Lord. Come on, you like to do the same thing? Isn't that great? <laughs> and then we, we define what is worship. And then some people say, oh, no, not to me. I don't like Matt Radman, these things. I like hymns. I like to sing the whole hymns, the battle hymn of the Republic, and I like to sing Amazing Grace, and I like to sing this, and I like to sing that. And you know what? We're both right. We like to sing these things. But if you focus on what you sing, songs were created by whom? By people. They might have been inspired by God, but it's creation. A song, it's part of man's creation. We did it. It wasn't God from heaven that came down and he said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. No. Someone got inspired. And this is a thing that was created. So when we worship, we can fail and miss the goal of worship, which is to glorify God. And we're focused in what is pleasing us, which is the tune, the beat, the lyrics, the song, the performance, the piano, the guitar, the drums, and we can get lost and worship worshiper, worshipers instead of worship, worshiping the Lord himself. Amen. We can be so tied in this that we say, oh, I love worshiping, tuning to hill songs. You know what? You're not called to worship hill songs. You're called to worship the Lord. Amen. So who are you worshiping? Now let's go back to this scripture in Romans chapter 1 and on verse 21, let's go a little bit uh, backwards. I don't like to read the Bible backwards, but we read verse 25 and I like to give you the, the, you know, the full frame of what uh, Paul is talking about. And he said, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So you see what scripture is talking is about this difference between worshiping God or worshiping things that were created. And these things are not just necessarily images of birds or an ox and all these foreign gods. You know, if you go to India, there's thousands of gods. They have the rat god and they have the elephant god or, and they have a holy cow and they have all these gods. It's not just about these images. But in our society, we can have other images, other things that we worship, things that come in between us and the Creator. And the focus of your life is defined by the things you love, by the things you worship. If you're just in, in, into hockey, hockey can become your God. And actually, Bell Center is the greatest temple in Montreal. People go there and they worship those those things they worship the player they worship the team they put a flag in the car and it's all of their lives rotates around a hockey team i'm not saying that's wrong you know you can love hockey but still you can put god above hockey and and focusing your worship in the lord of lords the one who created everything because uh, you know, through scripture we see these things, and we first we, what we see in this, uh, in this passage is that these people knew God or about God. You see, Romans chapter 1, it's not talking about people outside the church. In fact, if you, if you notice in Romans 1, 7, Paul really nails it and says this, this letter is for the church. And it's for the church in Rome. So when Paul is talking about these things, he's not talking about the outsiders. He's talking about people that were inside the church. People that instead of worshiping God, they were coming to church, they were listening to scripture, they were listening to the gospel, but they did a little thing, which is the, their worship, 
was focusing and was uh, geared in the wrong direction. You see, some people will say, well, I like, uh, I like Christianity, but I don't go to church because I just like to watch Joel Osteen on TV. That's awesome. That's great. Watch Joel Osteen and watch all the preachers that you like. But still God, that loves you, said, my will for you, it's far above what you think. And I want you to belong to a local body of believers, the church. So God will bring us to a church. And church cannot be replaced with just the things that we like. You see, in the last days, people will choose what they, they want to listen. If they don't like a message in one place, it's very easy. You know, we have a ton of churches around. You can get in your car and you choose, well, today I'm going to this church, tomorrow I'm going to that one. But God chose a place where you should worship Him. Amen. Not worship the church, not worship the building, not worship, you know, the preacher, but you worship God in a place. This is how Christianity works. This is why we were telling you, we would like to have you guys as members. Why? Because we, we know that God brought you here for a purpose. You didn't came here just because, you know, in your imagination, you said, well, today I'm going to South Shore. No, in his divine wisdom, God that loves you, he said, I want you to go there because there's this message being preached today. And I want, to, I want you to listen to this message. And when you receive the word of God in this way, God will talk to you. Second, these people, instead of worship, they decided to apply wisdom and logical thinking. Okay, let's try to figure this out. Let's try to understand with logic who God is. Or let's try to do a figure of our imagination. And doing, by doing this, they worship the creation rather than the creator. Now let's go to point two. Character is shaped by our worship. Now, um, also in this passage of Romans, we, we read in verse 28, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them to a debased mind to do what uh, ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covet uh, covetedness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceitful, maliciousness. They gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, dis disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless. Well, 24 different names. <laughs> 24. And before this even talks about gay lesbian behavior. And I don't want to enter into this. But bottom line is, when you worship the wrong thing, this will happen in your life. Are you following me? This is not a new doctrine. And this is not talking about people outside the church. Then you'll go to a church and you'll see, oh, those people in church, you know, they're full of malice. They gossip, they slander. Have you ever seen these things happening in churches? I did. I've been in church for, uh, you know, pastoring churches for 25 years. I've seen a lot of slander and bad behavior and deceitfulness. All, all these 24 things on the list happen as a consequence of not worshiping God the right way. So this is a fundamental importance. We can fail to understand that this can happen to us. And we can think, well, this is not for me, because, you know, I think I'm doing everything right. Question is, are you? Are you doing everything right? Who's, who's first in your life? Is it God? Do you really put God first? Or do you put your doctrine first? Or what you believe first? Or your church first? Or your, I'm not even talking about your hobbies and your uh, other aspects of your life, but I'm talking about spiritual life. And again, if you see Romans 1, 7, this letter were, was written to all of those, if you can put it there, to all of those who are in Rome, loved by God and called to be saints. So these things that we've read, they were not written about Joe that goes to a bar or to a casino. It's talking about Christians, Christians. And there's a list of 24 things that are bad, bad things. And when a church is more interested, for instance, in the building than in the creator, guess what's going to happen in the church? We have slander, 
You, we have inventors of evil, you know, we have uh, criticism, we have all these things, and I'm not here to give you bad news, but when people think they have a better doctrine than the pastor, and, uh, and, uh, and they, they think that they, they know better than anyone else, and they start to criticize people that are doing the work of God, guess what happens? The Bible specifically says that God allow these people to go in this direction. And this is what we don't want to happen here and what we will not see here because we are a church that puts God first. And when you put God first, when you enter into a building of worshipers that put God first, you can feel it. You feel it in the air. You feel that presence. You know that God is in operation. You will see the miracles. You will see amazing things happening. And this is the church that God calls us to be. Not a church that worships other things or worships the building or worships doctrine. But we are called to be the church that puts God first. That says, no matter what happens, no matter, I can have a storm in my life, but I will still worship the Lord. I will follow God. It doesn't matter. A thousand can fall to my left and ten thousand at the right. But I will still hold to God. God is my Savior. Let me ask you this question, very simple question. Because sometimes we get lost into these things of doctrines. And we say we're evangelical, we're Pentecostal. Uh, have you heard about this, uh, this lady, Mother Teresa? How many of you heard of, about Mother, Ter Mother Teresa? Okay, um, you know she was uh, what religion? Roman Catholic, right? Okay, so do we as Pentecostal believe the same thing as the Roman Catholic? Not fully. Uh, in terms of theology, it's very close, but not fully. Now, question is, is, he, is she in heaven or in hell? Hmm? <laughs> huh? Well, we don't know. But in your opinion, you know, in my opinion, she's in heaven. In my opinion, she's in heaven. However, if I go into the realm of doctrine, and if I apply evangelical doctrine to the latter, she's in hell. And now there's silence here. <laughs> and you, we don't want to talk about it. Why is she in hell according to evangelical doctrine? Because instead of praying to God the Father, she prayed to Mary. Mary was created. If you worship Mary, you're not worshiping the creator. You're worshiping the creation. So and this is a fundamental difference between evangelical Christians and Roman Catholics. In fact, uh, the Chinese government doesn't recognize the Roman Catholic Church as Christian, but they call the Roman Catholic Church Marian. Because the Communist Party recognizes that, yes, they are a Christian-based religion, but they don't worship Christ, they worship Mary. And we don't want to talk about these things. Pastor, come on, skip these things. <laughs> I want to make you think. I want, to, I want you to think about these things. Who are you worshiping? Are you worshiping a saint? Do you keep an, an image of your favorite saint? Do you worship Saint Jean Baptiste and get drunk once a year? <laughs> who's, your, who's your saint? Who do you believe in? You see, we're not to decide who goes to heaven or to hell. But our worship can be misled. Now, I read certain things that Mother Teresa wrote. And in fact, Though she prayed to Mary, she acknowledged someone above Mary. Amen. And she was not serving Mary, but she was serving God. Right. So part of her doctrine was wrong, I think. However, it's not up to me to decide who goes to heaven or to hell. And I've decided that I'm not going to criticize anyone that tries to seek God in their own way of trying to find Him. And listen, I'm not going to criticize 
Muslim imams. I don't think we're serving the same God, but they're trying to find God. And they're using the Old Testament. And, the, and they use the five first books of the Bible that we, we use. They use it too. And they try to worship God, the Creator. Do I think they're right? No. What I believe is that it's only through Jesus Christ that we can find our way to God. Amen. This, this is what I believe. I found Jesus. Now, is it up to me to decide if Gandhi or if Muhammad are in hell or in heaven? No. No, I have my opinion about these things. And I read the book of Romans. And what we, we read through scripture. And I firmly believe the message that I preach. I know that God revealed himself personally to me through Jesus Christ. I met God. He did miracles in me. I got saved. This is the message that I preach. But I need to understand that there are other people in the world that were raised with different religions that tried to seek God in their own honesty. And some of them are honestly wrong. So my role as a Christian is to tell them about God without antagonizing them and to tell them there's a way to find God that goes beyond what you can do. Goes beyond praying five times a day. Because it's not by praying five times a day, turn to Mecca, that you're going to find God. But it's when in your heart you acknowledge that you are a sinner and that God is holy and that you need God to forgive your sins. And only through the person of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus is possible to be saved. Amen. Amen. Now let's go a little bit further and let's go to the conclusion. But point number three, what is the right way to worship God? So we talked about different religions. I talked about different things, different aspects of our worship. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. So the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So here we see the Creator in operation. And it all, it all comes back to this passage of Scripture that describes God, the Creator. How, the, how does this describe God? Well, we see in the beginning, God created. So we see God here. As Christians, we say this is God the Father. He's the Creator. And then, verse 2, we see that the Spirit uh, of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And the Spirit of God, it's what we Christians call the Holy Spirit. And then, verse 3 says, and God said. So, the first thing that happened was sound. Sound. What, what is sound? Sound is a vibration. Sound is a vibration. And we can listen to these vibrations. So, so there was a vibration and there was sound. You know, scientists, they discovered that the universe doesn't have just two or three dimensions, or four, but many others. And this is called the string theory. And the string theory that you know, scientists now are studying and coming to a conclusion says that everything was created by vibrations. Atoms vibrate. It's like they call it string because they compare to a, a, a string of a musical instrument, like the violin or a guitar vibrates. And this vibration eventually will have consequences. So the first thing that happened was sound. And this sound, or the word, it's what the Bible defines later in the New Testament as Jesus Christ himself. So when we go to John chapter 1 and verse 1, let us read together, John 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing, anything made that was made. And... The Bible continues on to describe that the Word, or the Creator, is Jesus Christ Himself. 
Now, here it's where it gets a bit confusing because we have one God. Yet, as Christians, we say God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, this is us, humans, trying to dissect God and understand with our mind. You know, this thing that we call the Trinity, Trinity, it's not a doctrine from the time of Moses, and it's not a doctrine from the time of Jesus. In fact, it's a doctrine because as church started to study the Word of God, they started to find, okay, this is the Father. Here's Jesus. Here's the Holy Spirit. And if you go through Scripture, you can find Jesus anywhere. Why? Because He Himself, the Word, He's the Creator. He also said, I am one with the Father. I'm the, I'm the same person. Who was Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the Word that became flesh and lived among us. He was born just like one of us, like, like a person. God was born like a person. This is the great miracle. And again, in His birth, we see that the Holy Spirit covered Mary. And God came to Mary, and Mary said, let your will be done. And, and God just inseminated Mary. And the baby was born. Praise God. And Jesus was born just like one of us. And he lived among us like a man. So God could communicate perfectly with us at our level. God descended to the level of creation to communicate a message. And this is what makes Christianity different from Islam, different from Buddhists, different from anything else. Because all these religions have their teachings based in human knowledge. And people that were God-fearing people, let me tell you this, because they were God-fearing people, but they were just people. Jesus Christ, He was born as a person. But he was God, and he is God, and he died on the cross, shed his blood for you, ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of God. He intercedes for you. He takes care of you. You can talk to him, and he can answer you. Yes. Praise God. This is the Jesus we worship. So how should we worship God? What is the right way to worship God? Access God through Jesus Christ. He is the door. He is the door. He is the way. He is the only way, the only safe way to God. The Creator became just like one of us. In fact, in John 4, 23, Jesus was talking about these things with a theologian. And, uh, and uh, on chapter 3, and then on chapter 4, we, we follow up and we see, but the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father. Who? The Father. Who's the Father? God. But he, didn't he say, I'm one with the Father? Yes, he did. You see, God is beyond what we can conceive or imagine. And some people get really confused with this. Why is he saying, worship the Father? Why isn't he saying, worship me? Because he didn't want people to worship creation. And Jesus Christ, at that point, was part of creation. Are you following me? At that point, as a human being, he was creation. So no one should come and just worship him, though people kneel before him and worship him. And he didn't forbid that, but he was saying, you know, worship the Father. Who's the Father? It's the unseen God, Jehovah God. The God that created everything. So he's saying, the, the hour is here now. It's coming. In fact, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship God. How will they worship? In spirit and in truth. So the, the real way, the good way to worship God is in spirit and in truth. And we learn that people change this truth for a, a lie. People change the truth for a lie. So there's two things you need to do. Worship God 
and worship in spirit and in truth. If you change the truth, you cannot worship God. You might say you love God and honor God with your lips, but your heart is somewhere else. You might be worshiping a denomination. You might be saying, as I used to say, don't try to convince me with uh, that religion thing. I'm a Roman Catholic and I will be forever. It's the religion of my parents and I don't change, uh, I don't change a sports club. Why should I change religion? This is what I used to say. Why? Because I've accepted that the religion of my parents was good. But you know, Christianity is for people that think. Thinkers. People that like to see the Bible. Let's see what, if what this pastor is teaching is here in Scripture. And then we follow the Bible. But above following Bible or doctrines or things, we need to find God. So we need to worship Him in, first in spirit. It's not by knowledge. And second, in, in, truth, in truth. So uh, I'm going to skip a bunch of things. I'm going to ask you if you can put... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, the Spirit, this Spirit, the Spirit of God, says clearly, 1 Timothy 4, 1, that in later times, some believers will desert Christian faith and they will follow spirits that de deceive. They will believe in teachings or, or doctrines of demons. L later days. What is later days? It's today. It's today. So, there are teachings or doctrines, there are doctrines of demons. How do we judge if it's a doctrine of demons? When it doesn't honor Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Jesus himself, he said, test the spirits. He didn't say test people. He didn't say, you know, go to church and analyze the pastor. And some people actually come here to church to take notes or they check messages just to see if, it can, if it's if it confers with what they believe. But finding God in true worship, it's not about what you believe. Because what you believe today can change. You see, what you take for granted now can change. But God can never change. Amen. So it's important to keep good doctrine. Yes, it's very important. However, there's something above doctrine. And this is the, the, where we need to come to terms with our worship. Let's go to the last slide there. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. And, and we're going to have a word of prayer. And I would like just to encourage you to think about these things. And to decide in your heart, who are, who are you going to worship? In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul said about God who also made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills but the spirit gives life amen, amen? amen. do you want to be killed you want to receive life life more abundant yes. the choice is yours if you decide that you're going to be focusing your attention on the letter, and the letter, it's not that you don't study scripture. In fact, we have a Bible school running in our church because we want to make sure that we keep sound doctrine. And thank God for uh, 36 students that we, we have doing the, the school. We're going to level three in, in, a, in a few weeks. And I praise God for all the students. It's, it's good to study the letter. But if your focus is the letter, you will die. Listen to me. If you just pay attention to doctrines, you will die. You know, one of the reasons I don't listen to Christian radio here in our area, it's because half of the programs that I listen in our Christian radio, it's to attack preachers. And I really don't like it. I hate it. It's people that go on the radio and they say how Benny Hinn is of the devil and how Joyce Myers is misleading people and all these things. I don't like to listen to this. You know, if you don't agree with the preacher, move on. 
Jesus rebuked the disciples. They were casting out demons. They came to Jesus and they said, We found a fellow that was casting out demons in your name, but he's not walking with us. And we, we strictly forbid him to do so. Jesus answered, You shouldn't have done it. Because if someone is not against us, he's for us. Yeah. And they, they were just, oh, oh. So we don't have the exclusive of truth. No, you don't. South Shore Community Church, we strive to be a church with a sound doctrine. Our pastors keep studying and keep going to conferences and keep reading books because we want to excel at what we do. Listen to this South Shore. Letter kills. The Spirit gives life. So we need to have the right balance of learning and the right, but our focus is to worship God in spirit and in truth. I cannot worship God in spirit if I'm singing songs just counting the rhyme and saying, okay, this rhyme is not perfect. This is a bad song. Or if I'm just worshiping and I, I'm, I'm looking at the worship team and, and, I, and I think, well, Nash guitar, the A, the A string is out of, out of tune. <laughs> if I just focus on these things, and you're here and you say, I, I like the piano better to the left. The drums are too loud. You know, what are they dressing today? Why isn't the pastor wearing a tie? If you just focus on these stupid things, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend you. But these are things that really do not matter. But if you come to church and you say, today I'm going to worship the Lord. Amen. I'm not here to judge anyone. I'm here just to give my worship. Amen. And during the time of the message, you should say, speak to me, Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, God used the donkey to speak to a prophet. And if God was able to use a donkey to speak to a prophet, he might use me. <laughs> and you know why I'm not a donkey? Because I've never seen a bald donkey. <laughs> I'm not yet bald. <laughs> Listen, God can use anyone he wants. Anyone. Make sure of this. That the church where you attend preaches the gospel. Amen. That Jesus Christ is the focus. Amen. That you can find Jesus Christ in every message. Right. Not just an abstract God. You know, I can preach about God without mentioning Jesus. I can do it. Sometimes I'm invited to preach in other places. And I have to think, Lord, how do you want me to speak to these people? When I preached in the Roman Catholic Church, a few times that I preached in Roman Catholic churches, I didn't went there to offend and to say, that cross there, it's idolatry. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, you, you're cursed and your children are cursed. No. <laughs> We're not here to antagonize people. But we need to ask, Lord, and this, this is not just for pastors, it's for you. When you need to share the gospel, Ask the Lord, how am I going to share? You know, ne next week I'll, I'll be in Kitchener, Ontario, preaching for pastors. So I have 70 or 80 pastors there. And I believe I have something to give them. Many of them, they have 40, 50 years of ministry. But I'm not intimidated to go there and preach to these people. Why? Because I've decided that the work of God is not done by wisdom, but it's the Spirit. Amen. So if we seek God in spirit and in truth, if we say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me of your Holy Spirit every day. Lord, baptize me in your Holy Spirit. I want to be sensitive to you, Lord. I don't want to worship. Worship. I don't want to worship a pastor. I don't want to worship my church. I want to worship you. If this is you today, listen, you might have failed in the past. But today is the day where God is telling you, come to me. 
Come back to me. Come back to your first love. When you first loved me. You didn't know about scripture or the four spiritual laws or the doctrines of the Old Testament. You just came and you said, Lord, forgive me. Jesus Christ was looking at how people were praying. And there was this man doing this awesome prayer. Lord, oh Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, I am not like these people. Ooh. I don't know how, what was the tone of voice, but it should be like this. Or maybe something like this, like some Christians like to do. You know? you know, I don't know what he was doing, but he was doing the right thing for the time. And then there was this man just saying, God, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, this one was justif justified, that other, no, failed. You see, the things of God are very simple. To be justified, just need to open up your heart and say, God, have mercy on me. Let us all stand. Let's have a word of prayer. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What spirit? The same spirit. But that was hovering over the abyss. Genesis chapter 1. He was hovering over the waters. There was chaos. Everything was dead. But the Spirit was there. And Jesus Christ, the Word of God, said, Let there be light. And creation started. And that vibration, that sound, originated light. This still puzzles me when they will understand all these things. You know, I, I, my background is science. I love science. And the more I study the Bible, the more I see the truth is in there. Not in my textbooks. My textbooks will be old. If we're here 100 years from now, they're history. Human knowledge is always changing. But God never changes. Amen. And the Spirit of God is here to tell you, come to me. Worship me in spirit and in truth. How do you know if you're worshiping a lie? If your life is miserable? If you find yourself always, you know, in situations of slander, deceit, all those 24 things we've read about, even we didn't spoke, uh, we, I, I didn't mention, but gay and lesbian relationships, all these things are at the same level of all these other things. If you read Romans 1, it's all at the same level. For God being a homosexual, slander, this, this, that, those are things that happen in other people's life. We're not here to judge who you are. I'm not here to judge who you are, but I'm here to tell you that God loves you. He doesn't condemn you. He accepts you just as you are. Amen. If you just open up your heart and say, God, have mercy on me. He's a loving God. He loves the, the gay, gay lesbian as well as he loves you here at the church. You might think, oh no, God loves me better because I pay my tithes. You're wrong. God so loved the world. It doesn't say God so loved the church. God so loved the world. God loves you just as you are. Just worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to give you the opportunity to ask God for forgiveness and to become what we call saved or a Christian or born again. Because as soon as we invite God to come, there's a new reality that happens in your heart. And we'll talk about this further. The same God that said, let there be light. As soon as we invite God into your heart, your heart could be dark. But as soon as Jesus Christ enters your life, there's inner light. There's inner light inside of you. This is unexplainable. But now you receive inner light. There's a light. And suddenly, you listen to a preaching, you read the Bible, it makes sense. Because you have light. Before you didn't. So if you want to receive this presence of God, that's His Spirit. 
That's the Spirit of God. He will come inside of you, inside of us. When we invite God to come, His Spirit comes. And the first thing He does, He looks at the abyss of your heart, all your sins. Evil, deceitfulness, lust, murder, robbing. All of these sins, God looks into the, the abyss. And God says, nah, I don't like this. And He comes into your heart and He says, let there be light. And then, Lawrence, then light. Wow, there's light. Then Joe, there's light. Eric, light. And when the light comes, then you can come to church and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Let's give a hand of applause to the Lord. Praise God. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come here forward.